everybody doing today? So glad that you're here. You beat the storm to get out here today. And you came on Memorial Day weekend. You get an extra crown in heaven for what you've done and being here this morning. Give yourself a round of applause for being here this morning. Uh, we always love being in Sarasota. Uh, as Mike said, we've got, got some history here in the church. It always feels like coming to see family, obviously, with uh, Mike and Cindy being here. But coming to be with you all is a lot like being with family as well. And this church has done just so much for our family and praying for our family and staying up with our family for more than a decade now. It's just a, a real blessing. But I want to say this real quick publicly before we get going. One of my favorite things about coming to Sarasota is sitting on the lanai in behind uh, Mike and Cindy's house uh, while the kids are down for a nap or something else and just sitting with Mike and just telling about what's going on in life and getting from him wisdom, discernment as he just continues to pour into my life. And Mike, I'm so grateful for you. I'm so grateful for everything you poured into my life and into Nathan's life and to so many others. So grateful for your years, more than 20 years of leadership here in this church. The blessing that you are to me, I'm thankful for you. Just thankful for you. Aren't you thankful for him too? Because I know I am. Well, I want to talk today about uh, our relationship with God, our relationship uh, with God. And as I was preparing for this and thinking about this, I, I, I was thinking about my own relationship with God and when that started. Uh, I began a relationship with Jesus and was saved 22 years ago. I'm from Central Florida, and at the time we were attending the First United Methodist Church of Mount Dora, Florida. And the, this church had just hired on a new youth director and his wife, Jeff and Liz, and they were doing all kinds of innovative things to reach that small community and the communities surrounding it. Things like putting up a basketball goal in the parking lot, like just really cutting edge stuff there. They put, put in the basement of that church, they put a, a foosball table and a ping pong table and a, a pool table down there. So they were bringing in kids from the community and we were coming in and hanging out. And then they would get us all into this room and there were some futon chairs, and there were some beanbag chairs, and we would have a worship service. And we'd go into the worship services, normally looked um, the same every single week. They start off with a music video, some, some different musicians that were trying to use their music to reach people for Jesus. Y'all shake your head at me if you remember any of these bands. We used to watch DC Talk. Y'all remember DC Talk? Down with the DC Talk. D -d -d Down with the DC Talk. There was, uh, there was Carmen with his hit single, Satan Bite the Dust, uh, and then there was, there was Newsboys. When I say Newsboys, Take me to your leader, and they don't serve breakfast in hell. Those were the good songs from the Newsboys back in the day, right? So we'd watch these music videos, and then we'd have... And they would take and they'd print the lyrics onto what is a, like a clear piece of paper called a transparency. You put it on the glass, and then light shines up from underneath. It hits a mirror, and then it projects it on the wall. Some of the young people in the room were looking at me like I'm crazy. Google it. It happened. Overhead projector, okay? And so you would sit there. And the problem with the overhead projector was it was great. You could see the lyrics until if the song was longer than one transparency. Because see, then what would happen is the hand of doom would have to reach in and pull those lyrics on and put new lyrics on there. You'd be sitting there, you'd be sitting there singing a shout to the Lord, heading for the key change. And all of a sudden, here comes the hand of doom coming in there to change the lyrics. And so we'd listen to the worship songs, and we'd sing a little bit. And the most impactful thing that would happen is Jeff would get up, and he would talk about Jesus. And he would talk about the cross. It was the first time that I understood that Jesus wasn't just a person in history. The cross wasn't just an event in history. It had real implications for my life. It could really impact me. And so they're sitting on a beanbag chair against a support column in the basement underneath the fellowship hall of the First United Methodist Church of Mount Dora, Florida. I gave my heart and life to Jesus Christ, and I've never been the same since. And I'll tell you this. I'll tell you this. That that night, I knew that my sins were forgiven. That night, I knew that I was going to be with God in his heaven. But then someone came along, and they said, you just began a relationship with God. I thought to myself, a relationship with God? What does that mean? What does that even look like? 
And over the years, I've been privileged to be in some different churches, serve in some different churches, be a part of some different ministries. And what I found is, is that on every church, in every ministry I've ever been a part of, there are lots of people still trying to answer that question. What does a relationship with God look like? What does it look like? You could be in here and you could be like me and have known Jesus for a number of years. You could have known Jesus for decades. You could have made a decision years and years ago to meet Jesus and to make him the Lord of your life. But today, that doesn't look more like a relationship. It looks more like an obligation or a loose association. And you think a relationship with God is something that really only spiritual people understand. Or maybe you're here today and you've only recently trusted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And you're still trying to figure out what does it mean to know God. Or maybe you're here today and you don't have a relationship with God yet, but you're considering it. Maybe you're here visiting family because like me, you have family near the beach. And you're like, this is a lot cheaper than VRBO. So I'm going to go and visit my family Memorial Day week and spend time with them. Whatever the reason, wherever you're at with God today, I want us to think about what it means to walk with God. God. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to go to Genesis chapter 1. is where we're going to be at. Genesis chapter 1. We're going to start off in verse 26. And in the lead up to verse 26, here's what's going on. Uh, You've had God who's literally created everything. He has created the light, the water, the land, the plants, the animals. And now he's coming to a pivotal moment in creation. It's what one commentator called the crowning act of God's achievement in creation. It's when he created man and woman people. And whether you've read this passage of scripture a hundred times or this is your very first time, I believe that God has so much that he wants us to see here today. So Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, here's what the Bible says. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them rule over the sea, over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Then God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. Right from these two verses, we get this first point that I want us to understand. If you have your note sheet, you can go ahead and write this down. That we are created on purpose for purpose. You are created on purpose for purpose. What we understand from this passage of scripture is that humanity is not the result of an accident or an afterthought. It was a decision that God made, that God intentionally created us. Not only did he create us, but he created us to be like him. That in all of God's creation, there's nothing else that's supposed to be in the likeness of God. That's only you and me. Human beings are the only ones created to be like God. So with that in mind, I want you to understand this. No matter the circumstances in your life today, No matter the circumstances that were around your life's beginning, no one in this room is an accident. As a pastor, a friend of mine used to say it this way, Pastor Kevin Miller, he actually used to serve on staff here for a time, used to put it like this, there's no such thing as accidental people. Now, there may be accidental parents, some of y'all know about that, but there's no such thing as accidental people. The same God who spoke galaxies into existence, spoke you into existence as well. He knows your name. He intentionally created you. There's no such thing as accidental people. He did it on purpose. But not only are we created on purpose, but for purpose. In fact, we're created for multiple purposes. We see two in the text here today. The first is this, that we are created to enjoy a relationship with God. That we're created to enjoy a relationship with God. Look at here what it says at the beginning of verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. Notice the plural there, because the plural matters. I have an Asian grandmother, um, and she is wonderful, but the plural means absolutely nothing to her. I remember growing up, and I, I, would, say, I would say, Grandma, what you doing? And she said, well, I'm going to go to the Walmarts. Said, How many Walmarts are you going to, Grandma? She said, I'm going to have some noodles. Like just one noodle or like multiple noodles right there? Remember when I, when I told her that Beth and I were going to get married and she just looked at us, she smiled, and she said, you know what, you two, you're like two pea in pods. <laughs> Thank you, Grandma. That means so very much to me. The plural means absolutely nothing to her. The plural means a lot for us today. Who is God talking about 
where he says, I'm going to do this in our image, in our likeness. Let us make mankind. Who is he talking to? Well, if you look back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, the Bible says this, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Who is that? That's God the Father. Then in verse 2, it says, And the, the earth was formless and void. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the surfaces of the water. So we have God the Father and the Spirit. Elsewhere in Scripture, we know that God the Son, Jesus himself, was involved in creation. Several places all across Scripture. One place in particular is Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. For by him, him being Jesus, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. So we have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They're all there in creation three in one. We call this the Trinity. And it's a little bit of a mystery, but one thing we do know is that these three were in perfect relationship with each other because we serve a relational God. So when God created mankind, he created us to be in his image, to be relational, just like he's relational. And not just anything, but to have a relationship with him. That just by virtue of the fact that God created you, he is inviting you into a relationship with him, to enjoy a relationship with him. And that means from the first moment of creation, over centuries and millennia, there's never been a person created that God doesn't want to know him. I was thinking about this, I was thinking about middle school, junior high, and I was thinking about relationships in middle school and junior high. Y'all know relationships are never more difficult than middle school, right? I mean, that's a difficult period. Nobody looks back at their middle school years and say, those are the best years of my life, right? It's difficult. But maybe when you're in middle school, maybe you, you get a crush on some girl or ladies, maybe you get a crush on some guy. And you finally work up the courage and you decide, I'm going to pull out my number two pencil. I'm going to write them a note. And you put down in your best sixth grade English all your feelings and emotions toward them. And then at the bottom you say, I like you. Do you like me too? And then you give them options. Option one, yes. Option two, no. And option three, maybe, right? You're telling me there's a chance, right? Can I tell you this? And when you come to God, when you say to God, God, do you want me to have a relationship with you? Do you want me to know you? God never says no. He doesn't even say maybe. God always emphatically says, yes, I created you to know me. So we're created to enjoy a relationship with God. That's our first purpose. But then our second purpose is to have influence. To have influence. And we can't get this out of order. It's first to have a relationship with God and then to have influence. Look at what the Bible says here in the second half of verse 26. And let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. He says, let them rule. In your Bible, it may use the word dominion. The idea is God placing us in charge of, or to take ownership or leadership over an area of his creation. He's entrusting Adam and Eve with influence. And likewise, he entrusts us with influence. God's given us a role to play, a calling to be a part of. God wants to use your life in an extraordinary way to make an extraordinary difference on this earth. But that only happens if we do it in order. First, a relationship with God, then influence. You can't have your God-given influence until you have embraced fully your relationship with God. I was thinking about that. I was, I was thinking about a violin. And you've seen a violin before, right? The violins are beautiful instruments. Put them in an orchestra, give them a solo, and some symphonic music, it can really lift the soul. It can make your spirit feel like it's soaring. It can play a, another kind of melody, and it can comfort you, kind of a sad and a tragic melody. Or you can call a violin a fiddle, right? And get somebody on that thing, knows how to play it, and you can start stomping your feet and clapping your hands, having a straight-up hoedown with a fiddle, right? That's what a violin can do. It can have influence. But what is a violin really? It's just wood. It's just strings. It might be nice to look at. But in and of itself, it doesn't have any influence. With that in mind, I want you to listen to the words of this poem. I first heard it a year ago from a, a guy by the name of Dr. John Maxwell. It's originally by a lady who's named uh, Myra uh, Brooks Welch. Listen to these words. 
"'Twas battered and scarred, and the auctioneer thought it scarcely worth his while to waste much time on the old violin, but he held it up with a smile. "'What am I bidding, good folks?' he cried. "'Who will start the bidding for me? "'A dollar, a dollar, a two, or two? Two dollars, uh, anybody make it three? Three dollars once, three dollars twice, three dollars maybe, but no. Then from the room, far back, a gray-haired man came and picked up the bow. And wiping the dust from the old violin and tightening the loosened strings, he played a melody pure and sweet as the caroling angels sing. The music ceased and the auctioneer, with a voice that was quiet and low, said, now what am I bidding for the old violin? And he held it up with a bow. A thousand dollars, who will make it two? Two thousand, who will make it three? Three thousand once, three thousand twice, going and gone, said he. And the people cheered, but some of them cried, we don't quite understand. What change it's worth? Swift came the reply. It was the touch of the master's hand. And many a man, a life out of tune, and battered and scarred with sin, is auctioned cheap to a thoughtless crowd, much like the old violin. But the master comes, and the foolish crowd never can quite understand the worth of a soul and the change that is wrought by the touch of the master's hand. You see, a violin may just be wood and string, but you put it in the hand of its master, and it's got influence impact. It's a thing of beauty. Likewise, we are instruments in the hands of our Heavenly Father, of our Master. And if we'll trust Him in relationship and lean into that, then He can use our life for influence and to make an impact on this world. Purpose one, to enjoy your relationship with God. Purpose two, then to have influence. You were created on purpose for purpose. You say, well, that's all well and good, Steve, but what does this relationship with God look like? Well, what does it actually look like to be in that relationship with God? Well, let's keep on going in the text and see if we can't figure some of that out. Verse 27, and God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then in verse 28, and then God blessed them, and God said to them, two things there, I hope you saw them, God blessed them, and God said to them, God spoke to them, the same God that had just created all of the earth and everything there within, the same God who spoke all of it to existence and then created the intricacies of their ears, then spoke to them, spoke to them, because see, we're created to hear from God. We are created to hear from God. To actually hear from him through his word. Hear from him in prayer and sensing his Holy Spirit speaking to our souls. We are created to hear from God. Now what did God say to Adam and Eve there in the garden? What well, says this in verse 28? He told them to be fruitful and multiply. To fill the earth and subdue it. To rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky. And over every living thing that moves on the earth. Then God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on its surface for all the earth, and every tree which has fruits yielding seed, and it shall be food for you. And to every burst, uh, beast of the earth and every bird of the sky, to everything that moves on the earth which has life, I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. God said, I created you in my image. And I want you to fill the earth and multiply. I want you to spread my image across the globe. And I've entrusted you and given you dominion and allowed you to rule. I'm trusting you with influence. Take ownership of that influence. God says to them, and now I want you to observe all of the fruit. Observe the trees, the plants, the animals, this beautiful setting that I have given to you. See, I've put together a, an amazing backdrop by which you can have a relationship with me. God is orchestrating situations and circumstances, scenarios, so that he can get their attention, so that then they can begin this relationship with him. He's making everything just right to set the tone for them to know him. And I was thinking about this. I was thinking about my, uh, my, my, my first date with this girl named Beth uh, from college. And this girl and I had been friends for a little while, but I was ready to get on up out of that friend zone, if you know what I mean. And so one day, I was walking her 
uh, back to her dorm room one evening, because it's just my Christian duty to do that, make sure she's okay, right? And as we're walking back, uh, I knew that there was a spring formal coming up, and so I asked her, I said, hey, um, uh, you have plans for the spring formal? I mean, like, because if you were to ever with me, I mean, I don't know if we could ever like, be to, like, going together. I was very articulate when I asked her uh, about this. And so I asked her if she'd go to the spring formal, and she responded back to me, well, um, no. And at that very moment, there was a sound of shattering deep within my soul. And she must have sensed that because she looked at me and she said, well, no, 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 it's not that I don't want to go with you. It's just that I'm going to be out of town when spring formal happens. I said, well, um, could I take you out the next night? And she said, well, yeah, absolutely. So I said, that's great. I'm going to pick you up at this day, at this time, wear your most beautiful dress, and we're going to have a wonderful evening together. So the night finally came, and I went to her uh, dorm room, and I knocked on the door, and I opened up, and their roommates were there, and they were giggling, and they were acting strange because girls were really weird. And then she came to the door, and she was wearing the most beautiful red dress. I will never forget the way she looked in that red dress. Absolutely gorgeous. And I said, wow, I'm so grateful that tonight's finally here. We're going to have a really good time together. Here, put on this blindfold. A quick timeout, okay? For my single Christian brothers in the room, and you're wondering, how do I date a, a Christian girl? Well, leading off with a blindfold is not the best decision. Apparently, that can be construed as creepy. So just keep that in mind. Uh, when you go on your first date there. But she was a good sport. She put on the blindfold. We got in my car. We drove around for about 15 minutes. 15 minutes later, we show up, and we've only gone two blocks away from her dorm room. We went from her dorm room to the freshman girl's dorm across campus. And she looked at me. She's like, we, we just drove for 15 minutes in circles so that you could surprise me by bringing me across campus to the freshman girls' dorm. I was like, yeah, that's right. She's like, okay, good. You can go ahead and take me home. I was like, no, this is going to be great. We're going to have a good time, right? So we got up there to the freshman girls' dorm. We walked through the doors, and then she went to go hit the button on the elevator. And I said, oh, well, no, no, we're going to take the stairs. And she said, well, how many stairs do you intend for me to take? And I said, well, you know, give or take um, seven flights of stairs. And she said, okay, well, that's good. You can go ahead and take me home. I was like, no, 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 this is going to be great, right? So we started going up the stairs, and I went up, and she tried to go back down several times. I was like, no, 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 come on, we're going to keep going to the top. And when she got to the top of the stairs, she opened it up, and what had happened is I had asked the spring formal committee if I could have all their decorations, and I put them out on this rooftop of this girl's dorm overlooking downtown West Palm Beach under a night sky with music playing and a meal for us, and it was quite a sight to see. And it's amazing that she didn't run the other direction, right? I mean, that's a little much for somebody to put that on a first date. But I wanted that setting to be perfect because I wanted to express my heart for her. I wanted to tell her how I felt about her. And I wanted us to begin a relationship and to have a relationship. So I wanted to make a statement. And it must have worked out because this September we'll have been married for 12 years. That was my wife and I's first date. Me and Beth. That's exactly what God's doing in Genesis. He has built this beautiful creation. You ever walk outside and just think, wow, look at this. Look at the vast ocean. Look at the, 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 the giant treetops. Look up at the sky. Look at the clouds. And just wonder, wow, God, you created all of this. He says, yeah, I created all this as a setting for you, so that you could get to know me. And I want you to know that God is still orchestrating circumstances, situations, scenarios in your life, in my life, so that he can get our attention. Sometimes these things are wonderful things. Sometimes these things are hard things. But God is orchestrating all of these things so that he can get our attention, so that we can continue to grow in our relationship with him, so that he can speak to us. Because his desire is to speak to us. The question is, are we listening? Are we so busy sometimes asking, why God, that we fail to say, God, what is it that you're trying to say? Oh God, speak to me through your word, in prayer, through your Holy Spirit, because God's desire is to speak to us. We are created to hear from God. But not only are we created to hear from God, it's so much more than that. And you may be wondering, 
I know that God intends for me to have a relationship with him. I know that he wants to speak to me, but, but how close does he want me to be with him? How intimate is this relationship supposed to be? Well, I want you to flip over to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, because as I was studying for this message, this verse just kind of leaped off the page, got into my heart. And I think it really illustrates for us the kind of relationship that God wants us to have with him. Genesis chapter 3, and I want you to look in verse 8. The Bible says this. They heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Adam and Eve, they hear the sound of God walking in the garden. Notice it says they didn't see it. They heard it. How is it that they were able to discern just by the sound that that was God? How is it that they knew that sound right there, that's the sound, that's the sound of the footstep of God? Well, it's because they'd walked with him before. Every day, day after day, they walked with the Lord in the, in the garden in the cool of the day. They were so close to him, so intimate with him, that they knew the sound of his footsteps. But you might say, okay, I get that, Steve. I, I get they walked intimately with God. I, I get that, that they knew God. I get that they were completely familiar with God. But see, this is Genesis chapter 3. And isn't Genesis chapter 3 where they messed the whole thing up? Isn't Genesis chapter 3 where Adam and Eve disobeyed God and everything came undone? Well, yeah, you're absolutely right. Because see, if we continue on in Genesis chapter 3, Verse 8, it says that they heard the sound of the Lord walk in the garden in the cool of the day, but the man and his wife, they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees in the garden. Why are they hiding? They who had been in the presence of the Lord, why are they hiding? Well, it was because God had given them one rule, that they should not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. And they chose to disobey that one rule. And disobeying God is, by definition, sin. And sin brings brokenness and separation. And at the very moment that they chose to disobey God, at that very moment, brokenness and shame and sin and imperfection and everything that we consider to be wrong with this world came flooding into what should have been God's perfect creation because of their sin. So yeah, they blew it. And they started running, and they walked away from God, and then they went into hiding, trying to hide from God. Do y'all remember that classic game that we played when we were all kids, hide-and-seek? Do y'all remember hide-and-seek? Who didn't love a good game of hide-and-seek, right? Do y'all remember how it's played? You have one person that's it, and then you have all the other people they are supposed to run and hide, right? So the one person that's it, they go to count, and they got to hide their face, and you count 1 to 10, you always had that kid that tried to count 1 to 10 as if it was a single word. What do you Professor 7 and 10, right? And then you have the other kids who are like, no, 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 you can't count that fast. You have to count slower. Count, count like they do in Mississippi. Because everybody knows people in Mississippi count so good, right? 1 Mississippi, 2 Mississippi, 3 Mississippi, right? All the way up, 10 Mississippi. Ready or not, here I come. And while that person is counting, what are you trying to do? You're trying to run, trying to find that place that you know you're going to be invisible. That you know no one's ever going to find me here. You get down small, you get crouched down, you get into the darkness, and you get in there and you hide. And you think, this is how I'm going to win. And that may have been the way to win when we were kids playing hide and go seek. But that's a surefire way to lose in our relationship with God. See, many of us do the same thing with God, don't we? We have some sin and issue in our life, some issue of shame. We just get busy. And before we know it, there's a little bit of distance there. And before we know it, we find ourselves hiding from God. And before we know it, instead of running to God, we're going the other direction. We're hiding from Him. And we all experience that at different moments in our life. You may be experiencing that today. I know I've experienced it in my life. So I want to show you some hope that I found from this verse as I was reading it. Because just as Adam and Eve went into hiding, what does the Bible say again at the beginning? It says that they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Just as they're trying to walk away, just as they're trying to hide, God is walking toward them. He knows their sin. 
There's nothing he doesn't know. He knows their brokenness. He knows that they disobeyed, but he is still choosing to walk toward them. Not only that, then in verse 9, he calls out to them, and the Lord God called to the man, and he said to him, where are you? But it's not because he didn't know where they were. He's trying to get them to come out of hiding. He's trying to get them to come back to him. And so he leans out there and he says, hey, where are you? And they finally come out of hiding. They finally come before him. And when they get before God, was there judgment? Yes. Were there consequences? Yes. But was there redemption? Hallelujah. Praise God. Yes, there was redemption for them. And we know because of that, that even when we walk away from God, God is still willing to walk toward us. Even when we walk away from God, He is still willing to walk toward us. There's a song that I've been listening to uh, in Birmingham, where I live. And I know that you've been singing it here on Sunday mornings as well. It's called Reckless Love. And I love the bridge to that song. It says this about God. There's no shadow you won't light up. No mountain you won't climb up coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down. No lie you won't tear down coming after me. So where do you find yourself today? Do you find yourself hiding because of sin, shame, busyness? Have you grown numb to God? Are you hiding today? Would you be willing to say, I am no longer content for knowing God from a distance. I'm no longer content from knowing about God, but not knowing God. I'm no longer content from being far away. Today, I want to come to Him. The Bible promises us this in James, that if we will choose to draw near to God, He will choose to draw near to us. Would you choose today to come before Him? Maybe you've known God for a number of years. Maybe today you're hiding. Maybe today is the day you say, I don't want to hide anymore. Or maybe for somebody else in this room, maybe you don't feel like you're hiding. But maybe God's been dealing with you on a certain step that he wants you to take. A certain next step. Maybe it's baptism. Maybe it's a call to some leadership that he's asking you to take on. Maybe it's some area of obedience in your life. And God's calling you, I want you to take this next step. But you haven't taken it yet. You know, it's awfully hard to walk with God if you're not willing to take the next step that he wants you to take. And maybe today is the day that you say, okay, God, I'm ready today is the day that I'm going to take the next step so that I can walk with you. Or maybe it's that you're here today, and you know that you don't have a relationship with God. Maybe it's that you're here today, and you know what? I know about God. Maybe I have family members that know God. I know about Jesus, but I don't know Him. I don't have a relationship with Him. Can I tell you that today can be the day that you begin that relationship? I told you at the beginning of this message, I've known Jesus for 22 years. Still today, it's the best decision that I have ever made in my life. Knowing Jesus an incredible journey. There's so much that God has for you. So you may say, Steve, that that sounds great. I I want to know Jesus, but I wouldn't even know what to do. That's the beauty of it. You don't have to do anything. Jesus has already done everything that needs to be done. Jesus knew that you couldn't get to God on your own because of sin. Just like Adam and Eve, we've all got sin issues. We've got all got hurts, habits, and hang-ups. Every single person And so what do we do with all of that? Well, because of our sin, because of our disobedience to God, that comes with a penalty that is death and forever separation from God. But because Jesus loved you so very much, he came to this earth, he lived a perfect life, a life that you and I could never live. And then he died in your place on the cross. Paid everything that you needed to be paid on the cross. Even greater than that, Then he rose from the grave three days later, and he conquered your sin, and he conquered your shame. And now he says, you can come to know me. So all you have to do today is call out to him and say, God, I believe that you've done that for me. And right now I'm ready to surrender it all to you, turn my life over to you. You do that today, and you can begin the relationship with Jesus. Let's enter into a time of prayer here. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. and, And in this time right now, maybe you're that person.